Okay, we're back. <clears throat> we're going to talk about Area 5 next. So we're going to jump back over to our map, and we'll continue our DMs tour through White Plume Mountain. So one of the things we want to do here is, uh, let's get this title screen out of the way here. We'll go back to the original map here done by John Pintar. If you look at the original map, excuse me, <clears throat> you'll notice that there's a separation between the room here, 5, 13, and 12. There's a wall. It isn't open and connected like this. I don't know why this was skipped. Maybe when he was making this map, he just decided not to do this. But there's actually supposed to be a solid wall separating this area because this is an entire completely different encounter where the players are coming in from other direction. So just ignore that. If you're doing VTT, you'd have to do something about this yourself. So this encounter is actually happening in a room here. So to make this simple so people don't get confused, I'm going to leave the old map up, which is a 30 by 20 room. Remember in the old days, all the D&D modules used one square equals 10 feet. And in later years, you know, since like <clears throat> fourth edition of D&D &D and onward, everyone's using uh, one square equals five feet. All right, let's just get to it here. When the players enter this area five, in this room are five flesh columns lined up against the north wall. Okay, so uh, each has a number on their chest, five, seven, nine, 11, and 13. Number five, which would be like the first one from the far left, says... One of us does not belong with the others. If you can pick it out, it will serve you, and the others will allow you passage. Let's make sure we've got the microphone set here good so you can hear me okay. All right, there we go. It's not too loud. <clears throat> so the players have to figure out which one. So what's tricky about this is if one guy goes out, three! <laughs> I mean, if you, have, if you have players at your table that goof around and say, seven, no, 11, you know, like in Monty Python, or red, no blue, you're going to have to have some kind of situation where the golem that asked the question... Right? Let's say number five asked the question. Um, I'm ready for your answer. What is your answer? Something like that. This isn't giving you tips on how to run it. That's what we're doing these videos for, right? So you have to make sure the players jibber jabbering and talking and figure out what it is. Um, give the right, give their answer. If they don't give the right answer, all of them attack, right? And so these <clears throat> uh, five flesh golems, you can look them up in your monster manual, but they're like AC9. They don't have any armor on. They're 30 hit points. They do like 2 to 16 damage when they strike. So if like two of them are hitting one person and do, you know, roll a bunch of D8s that are pretty nasty, you could have like 7, 7, 7, 8, and 6. I mean, you could have some nasty damage going off. Remember, flesh golems can only be hit by magical weapons. So unlike typical flesh golems that will take full damage from magical fire or cold attacks, saving throws are applicable, electro attacks restore one hit point of damage to the golems for each die of the attack. Like, it's alive, it's alive, like Frankenstein, right? And in effect, so uh, a six hit die lightning bolt will cure the golem of six points of damage. So make sure you pay attention to that detail. So uh, magical fire and cold, right? They take full damage from that. It's electrical attacks that like heal them. So that's what happens in that area. Then there's another one of these big eight foot by eight foot doors happening here. And then we can go back to John's map because it's really nice. Remember, these are big doors. Go up some steps and you got this turnstile here to get into Walt Disney World. Now we've got a picture here of the Walt Disney World entry point, right? Let's pull that up for you. This is a classic picture. It's all fuzzy looking because it's so small. I just paste it here for you to follow along with it. I think it's kind of funny. So this is a short flight of stairs that lead up to a dry corridor. Just around the corner is a turnstile that allows passage only one way forward and it turns counterclockwise like you might see a baseball field or something like that you're gonna have to kind of destroy this to make your way back a golem could rip it out or strong characters could try with equal chance percentage to bending the bars and lifting gates based on your strength number so if you have the golem that's helped you that you answered the question because the right answer in the previous uh room with the numbers five seven nine eleven and thirteen the one that doesn't belong is nine because it's not a prime number prime number is like you know, Jody Foster and Contact are n numbers that are only divisible by themselves and one. Okay? Nine's divisible by three. So that's why nine's not a prime number. Every other number, five, seven, 11, and 13, you can't divide those numbers by anything else other than themselves and one. Like 11 divided by itself and one. You can't divide 11 by seven, six, five, four, three, or two. So that's how prime numbers work. It's a. If you have really young people playing this, though, they may not be able to get that. They may have to just fight their way through it. You, If you're a dad and you're running this for some kids in a neighborhood, you may want to turn this down and make number nine doesn't have a nose. I mean, whatever. It's D&D. &D. Make sure it's fun. So once you get past this turnstall thing, we're going to go down the corridor here to this next area. And this is a really neat room. And John did a great job with this. Uh, I love this room. And there's a cool picture for it, too. I'll pull the picture up real quick. But the, the room is just so much, the graphics of the room is just so much better. I'll leave this up while I read some of the description, right? 
Um, the door opens into a stone platform in a large natural cave. The ceiling averages 50 feet above the level of the platform. So you see these three Errol Otis characters drawn here? His character is always scrawny looking and half naked. It's really weird. It's like I went to the dungeon in my loincloth and I've got my axe and my helmet and my shoes. <laughs> Check this guy out. <laughs> he doesn't have anything but his, his underwear, his crappy floppy shoes, his dumb hat, and his crappy two-handed axe. <laughs> And the other guy's wearing a thong. I, I, Errol Otis's characters always look goofy, but his artwork and his line weight and his shadows are, are wonderful. So the platform these three jokers are standing on, 50 feet above this, is the top of the cavern, okay? Now, the floor of the cave, which is 50 feet below, all the way down here, is boiling mud. That will kill you. There was a Facebook conversation. There was some, how much damage do you think boiling mud? It would kill you. Like, it doesn't matter what kind of armor you're wearing, unless you're in, like, a deep diving suit or something. Um, so... In the map, if you look at the old map, there's two spots marked spot A and spot B. These are geysers that intermittently erupt, and you can take damage based on how far away you are from the geyser. Now, in John's map, he doesn't mark the geysers. The geysers aren't marked. He just has this lake of boiling muck, and this is a, what a great map, and the detail on this is fantastic. So you're going to have to figure out like where this is in relation to... Um, the geysers. There's one about here, and there's one about here. So you may need to wing that a little bit if you're doing this on Foundry VTT or, or Roll20 or whatever the hell the other thing's called. I forgot. Okay, so um, what happens is geyser A will erupt every five minutes, and geyser B, the one that's further down, every three minutes. So opposite the entrance is another stone platform about 90 feet away. Between them is a series of these wooden discs suspended from the ceiling by massive steel chains. The discs are about four feet in diameter and three feet apart. Each disc is attached to its chain by a giant staple fixed to its simple, uh, center. Excuse me. The discs swing freely and will tilt when weights placed upon them. The disc and the chains, as well as the walls of the cavern, are covered with wet, slippery algal scum that lives in the water and nutrients spewed up from the geysers. This coating gives it a feeble, phosphorescent glow. See, even John, when he did this, he made sure to put some green stuff on here. His maps are so great. They're probably the best maps that anyone's made. They're better than any cartography I've ever seen in anything. He's really freaking talented. Awesome guy. Slovenia artist for the win, right? When the geysers erupt, they reach nearly to the roof. So remember, it's erupting from 50 feet below this platform all the way up to 50 feet. So it's almost 100 feet up in the air, this big erupting, boiling, uh, was it Yellowstone National Park type stuff? You know, nasty, boiling, burning muck eruption happening with all the steam vents and happening, okay? So um, if the player is going to get over here and they don't use some kind of magical means they're gonna need to kind of jump to this platform grab the chain and then your feet will wobble back and forth like something a survivor challenge you can swing back and forth and jump to the next one there is only a few descriptions in the actual module about how to handle this let's just read that through you okay because falling into the mud is instant death right unless they've done something to prepare themselves like uh, protection from fire or some kind of heat protection. Characters with 18 strength or better have a 65% chance of holding on to a disc that's adjacent to an erupting geyser. For each strength point less than 18, there's a 10% lesser chance for hanging on to the disc. So therefore, strength of 17 would be 55. Strength of 16 would be 45, etc., etc. So However, each disc the character located further from the geyser, there's a cumulative chance of 5% greater of holding on one step for each step away from the uh, um, geyser. So what they're trying to do is when the geyser erupts, and if you're right next to it, your percentage chance to hang on is this calculated by your strength, and that drops and becomes a little bit easier to do as you move further and further away, right? So, for example, uh, the damage... Uh, let's go to that part too. If you're right next to it, it's five to 50 points of damage when this thing erupts. Remember, five minutes and three minutes. Five minutes and three minutes. There's a two minute gap in between these things, right? Um, that's 5d10 damage. If you're one away, it's 4d10 and so on. 3d10, 2d10, 1d10, 1d6, 1d4 for anyone in the cavern. If people are in the cavern on the platform while Billy or the thief or someone is trying to zip across or whatever is happening, you're going to have to, as a dungeon master, have some kind of a timer on your phone or something on your watch that no one really sees you watching a timer. And I actually would want to do this in a, such a way where I'm tracking down the time while they're talking and conversing and figuring out what to do. But when they ask me questions and getting clarification, um, I don't actually count that time. So I would, I, would, I would buffer that in my mind. I don't want to kill the party here. What I want them to do is feel this pressure of timing things, right? So um, what happens here is if you make a saving throw when these eruptions happen, you take half damage. So that's pretty much the trap. 
There's no real description of the mechanics of just jumping and grabbing onto the chain. So unlike in Pathfinder or D&D 3, 3rd edition, 4th edition, 5th edition, they have all these damn checks all the time for everything. There's no checks here. So AD&D, as long as you say, I take a run and I jump and I grab onto the chain. And you know it's described as slippery and all this kind of business. There's no checks for anyone like a save versus breath weapon or paralyzation. Now you could do this. And if you were to do this, I would just use a basic roll a d20, your dexterity or less. Not higher or less. That people that have high dexterity of 18, there's only a 10% chance of failure. Someone with 10 dexterity, eh, 50% chance of failure. But if they slip and fall, there's one die roll, they're going to fall in the muck and die. Now, if they're all roped together and being smart, then yeah, that's fantastic. In real life, if you and I were to do this, we would probably die. All right, let's move on to the next area. Once they navigate this boiling mud geyser room that's 100 feet cavern, they have this big, massive door here, and then they have this long hallway to another door. Now, this is a vampire room, and I want to bring up some details for you on this because running vampires requires some savvy as a, as a dungeon master. I pulled up the original vampire entry in the old monster manual. Let me read this to you first, and then we're going to look at the vampire stuff in the meantime, right? This is the layer of the vampire, and it's unpronounceable. C-T-E-M-N-M-I-I-R. I'm going to take a shot at this. This will probably be a, a YouTube short. Centimere. <laughs> Centimere. Something like that. And it doesn't. it isn't a game developer's name spelled backwards, so good Lord, who knows what it is. All right, this is an AC-1. Hit point 40 monster. He is compelled by a curse to remain here in a trance, except when defending the treasure that lies in a niche on the floor under his coffin. He automatically awakes at the approach of intruders. The door to the room is permeated with tiny holes through which he can pass in gaseous form. Let's go back to the map real quick, okay? This is an interesting point here. So this is the room we're talking about. I can only pull the map over so far. The one with the, the sarcophagus or the coffin, not this one over here. This door has got holes in it. Let's zoom in so you can see a little bit better. So if you come deep dopping down the hallway with mud on your boots and gunk and lots of business, he's going to hear you coming. And once you open the door and come in here, he is compelled to defend. He'll automatically awake. So you might have him like kick open the top of the coffin and jump up and start attacking everyone, right? So um, this room has a permanent darkness spell on it, which the vampire is unaffected. It means he can see perfectly well. If you destroy his coffin, it doesn't bother him because Caraptus has spares hidden away. Underneath the coffin, right, is the treasure, Whelm. What of the three artifacts stolen from the beginning story of the entire adventure? Okay, we'll talk about Whelm in a minute. Let's go back and talk about how do you make a vampire fight cool, right? Look at the movement rate. It's 12 and 18. That means if he turns into gaseous form, it's 18, which is really fast. Now, remember way back in D&D, if you haven't ever played before, each one of these two tick marks means inches. That really means 120 feet in one melee round, which was one minute. But you can't really divide it up into seconds and get a reasonable number because everyone can move more than 12 feet in, in six seconds. So it's kind of a tricky math problem. When I play AD&D, I just give everyone a flat 25 movement rate, which is five, five inch squares. Um, five one inch squares which are five feet each but that's up to you okay if you're playing rules as written this guy can move the same speed as an unarmed person now see i've highlighted in red here 1876 strength that means you want to pull your player's handbook out uh, and take a look at what does 1876 strength mean to bonus to hit because his hit dice is given here right and number of attacks is only one five to ten points of damage that's 1d6 plus four right because if you roll six and add the four, it's a ten. If you roll a one, add the four, it's a five. It's the energy drain that's nasty, and he can only be hit by a plus one magical weapon or higher. Exceptionally intelligent. You've got to play this like a PvP fight, right? So the second thing is, if he hits you, it's a powerful blow, causes five to ten damage. You saw that. It's powerful negative force drains two life energy levels from the victim, complete with corresponding loss of hit dice, ability level, attack level, etc. Meaning if you're like a level 10 druid, you may not be able to cast a certain level of spell that you could only do if you're, if you're on level 10. This is two life energy levels. This is one of the most nasty things in AD&D. It's really hard to mitigate. People hate having their life levels drained and having to go do things to repair it. Let me give you a couple of comments about that, right? Make sure that when this guy attacks you behind the scenes, I like to look at the character and if he hits your your skin, if he, if he hits you with his 
hands clawing at you and it hits your skin, that's where it's bad. If you're in full plate mail, he's not going to do this to you. If you're a wizard, you're like, don't get close to me, dude. So you, you, you want the players to play against the vampire that way. You want players not getting touched. If you have a melee guy, he comes in front, occupies this guy, and starts smashing him, that's fantastic. And remember, clerics can turn, but this guy has eight hit dice, right? And he's got magic resistance to describe below. Now remember, he can only be affected by magic weapons. He regenerates three hit points per melee round. If you bring him to zero hit points, he's not killed, but forced into gaseous form and must return to his coffin within 12 turns, which is 120 minutes or two hours. Rest eight hours and reform into corporal body. When he's in gaseous form, you can't do anything to him. So what he would do is, like, if you get him down to zero hit points, he turns the gaseous form, goes through the holes in the door, unless you left the door open, and then goes out and flies around the dungeon and doesn't do anything. It's always kind of fun to have him use the gaseous form. Sorry, that's the Kelpies in the next area. To use the gaseous form to tactically change his position and fool you. Like, he's intelligent, right? He's not it's exceptional intelligence. You start jamming him, you do something to it. The cleric says, I go up and I do this and have his fail a saving throw and he turns into gaseous form and there's nothing. Like, then we're fighting for a few seconds. you got to think like a rogue in PvP, okay? So play this guy nasty. Now remember, if he gazes at someone, this is something he would intentionally do. Like, he would turn and look at one person and look right at them, right? He has the effect of he's charming that person and the victim subtracts two from the saving throw versus magic. If you fail that saving throw, you will become charmed, as if you've been successfully struck by the charm person spell. All vampires have the ability to summon creatures to aid them, but those are usually just bats to get in your way. They aren't going to be anything that's going to help fight when you're underground. If he was out in the open, he'd be able to summon 3 to 18 wolves, okay? But it takes a while for them to get here. So... He'll recoil from strong garlic, the face of a mirror, a cross. Those things just keep him at bay. They don't really do any damage. He might hesitate for one to four rounds trying to find who can I lunge out at and try to strike and slap in the face. Going for the eyes, going for the face, trying to claw people around the neck, trying to bite them. Like you, that's the upper body type attacks, what you want to have happen. So how do you kill a vampire, right? Because remember, if he gets to zero health, he can turn to gaseous form. So he can be killed by the following method. Exposure to direct sunlight. That's not really going to happen down in here because you have to be exposed to it for a full turn. Immersed in running water for three melee rounds. That's probably not going to happen. Even if someone does create food and water, they're not going to have enough water to kill him. If a wooden stake is driven through his heart, he'll be killed for as long as the stake remains. What usually happens is players with magical weapons of plus one or higher beat the guy down. His armor class is only one. It's not that bad. He tries to charm someone. When the person's charmed, that becomes a problem because the party doesn't want to kill that person. They want to kill the vampire, get him down to zero hit points, and then he'll zap out of there, and you got like you know, two hours of not having to deal with this guy. Okay. It's always cool to talk about these things, you know. Throw in your comments below. Say, hey, you know, we run vampires. I like to do this. You're not talking about this. You should talk about that. I don't like the I like the energy drain as it is. Make the party do restoration, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, I mean, you can debate about it. That's totally fine. I'm making what I think is fun factor suggestions. All right, great. One third of the dungeon's goal, which is retrieving the three artifacts, happens next. Whelm. What is it? Is a lawful neutral plus three hammer, plus five for dwarves. That's nasty. Intelligence of 15, ego of 18. Now, for those of you who don't really know what we're talking about here, I won't go off too much of a tangent on it, but ego is a, when a weapon is a living, breathing, intelligent weapon, it's like Stormbringer. It has an intelligence. It can communicate with you telepathically. It has a personality. It's almost like an AI, right? Um, so this hammer, uh, it has a purpose to kill all trolls, giants, goblins, including bugbears and hobgoblins, it can be thrown and will return to you like Thor's hammer up to 150 feet three times per day, but only if you're a dwarf. It will act as a hammer of stunning. One time per day, when you strike it on the ground, it sends forth a shockwave that stuns up to 45 hit points of enemies up to 60 feet for one to four rounds. If they fail the save versus spells, Whelm also detects gold and gems and the presence of goblins. A drawback is the bear of the weapon will come under the influence of a severe case of agoraphobia, fear of wide open places, which is why it's tied into dwarves. You almost feel like this is a dwarven artifact. So you'll fight at minus two when you're not inside a building at night, at best of all, or underground. So that's very tricky. If someone goes on another venture and they're going to go to Hidden Tron and Tomoshan, they'll be okay when they're underground. If you're outside doing an adventure outside, 
you're going to be at minus two chance to hit, but it's a plus three hammer, so it's not meant to be that big of a deal, right? Um, it's obviously a dwarven weapon. There's also treasure in here. There's 10,000 silver pieces. Um, oh, gosh, what else is in here? 9,000 gold pieces, six leather sacks that hold the gold, a potion of ESP, a potion of black dragon control, three, uh, a scroll of three summoning spells, magic mouth, dispel magic, and monster summoning too. So there's a little bit of loot in here. So what we'll do is we'll take a quick break, and then we'll go to the next area. So we've so far... In part one, we've gone from here. We dealt with the Gyno Sphinx, got past the Wall of Force. We went down to this first area here where the globes were, got the key, came up to here. Remember, there's a false wall here, gone through the turnstile, navigated the green mucky cavern with the geysers, fought the vampire, got rid of him, and then you've gotten Whelm. That's one of your part of your mission. So one third of the whole adventure is pretty much completed. What we're going to do now is everyone has to backtrack and have to figure out how to get past the turnstile here, because there's only one way. You have to bash it to death. Go back through here. Remember, there's a wall here. There's not. You can't go over here to this picnic table and start playing Magic the Gathering. Got to run down here through the water, right, and come all the way back down here. There's no Gyno Sphinx anymore unless you fought her and killed her. Next, we're going to go up this way in the next uh, chapter, okay? And we'll see you in a few minutes, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 